Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this session. I'm absolutely delighted to bring to you today Scott Preston. Scott is an emergency management and business country professional at Multicare Health System in the US. He's been in business continuity since 2005, at least, almost 20 years, been in other related fields, and with a strong emphasis on emergency preparedness, which of course is absolutely critical to the healthcare industry, where the whole emphasis is on human life and safety. Personally, I learned a lot, and I think anyone else who listens to this podcast, particularly someone who's not from the sector, will certainly learn a lot. And our question to Scott was to understand what makes business continuity different in the healthcare industry. By the way, this session was recorded some time ago as part of our knowledge industry series on healthcare. We've covered so far healthcare, insurance, aviation, IT disaster recovery, and a few others. And if you're interested in understanding about business continuity in different sectors, do please let us know. Perhaps you can put a comment on this podcast and we'll try and address your request as soon as we can. Thanks so much. So without further ado, I present to you Scott Preston. Now, if I may ask you the question that we have, the first one that I have for you is, uh, what makes business continuity different or possibly even difficult uh, for the healthcare industry? Um, how would you need to do things different uh, from others? If I understand the question is, what makes business continuity different in the health industry from other industries? Yes, that's right. Uh, a couple of different things. Uh, first, obviously in healthcare, uh, it's critical to the communities that we serve. So, um, for example, if we were a, a retail industry serving coffee, Starbucks is centered here in Washington State in the Puget Sound region where I operate. Uh, as much as we enjoy Starbucks, the Starbucks would go offline. Uh, although there are certain coffee drinkers who would argue with me, I would say it's not necessarily critical to the community. <laughs> um, a healthcare system simply doesn't have that option. Uh, our communities are 100% reliant on healthcare. Uh, for everything from you know your your typical doctor visit all the way to the emergent situations that our uh, emergency responders utilize. So, uh, and having been a, a firefighter and EMT responding to 911 calls and medical calls, the, we absolutely must be able to you know pick up our patient and take them to the hospital. So the hospitals never have the option of just closing their doors. They can go on something that's called divert, where they say we are unavailable right now to take someone, but that's generally considered to be a short-term, very term limited capability. While there's um, a lack of availability in the emergency department, or perhaps there's something going on that's affecting the emergency department's ability to serve the community that way. But it's, uh, in the end, the community is absolutely 100% reliant upon those hospitals for all levels of care. So we simply do not have the option of just closing our doors on that we must remain open no matter what uh, which means that we have to have a, a fairly sophisticated level of planning in place Absolutely. to be able to address that um, mm -hmm. so our plans uh, we have both enterprise level plans that deal with it security and things of that nature but we also have very uh, low level uh, department level plans to address whatever contingency it is that we're trying to plan against uh, whether it be in terms of a specific threat or whether it be in terms of resource uh, protection utilization against the potential impact that way. Um, the other thing that's been going on that we're having to manage as, you know, especially with COVID is a series of surges that we'll see where uh, we'll see first a, a spike in the reported COVID uh, exposures and cases from our health department uh, doing the, the case tracking and case monitoring, contact tracing, that sort of thing. Uh, then we'll see a spike with regards to inpatient uh, input, so we'll go from the emergency department into actual inpatient beds and things of that nature. Um, and then about, on average, 10 days later, we'll see a spike in our morgue. Uh, mm -hmm. A certain portion of those patients will not be coming out of the hospital. Uh, and that has been a challenge for us too. Last summer in 2021, we had to do some significant additional uh, morgue planning because our morgue capacity was being overwhelmed. And the systems that we have in place to manage the uh, the morgue, you know, going from the hospital to the 
the final resting place and the funeral home, that sort of thing, was becoming overwhelmed. So that mm -hmm. we're having to uh, do some additional expansion of more cap capability uh, in terms of uh, refrigerated trucks and trailers and things of that nature, and having to really coordinate with other healthcare systems and our health department in addition to the private mortuary services to ensure that we weren't being overwhelmed that way too. So it's, I, I think that's probably the number one key thing is, you know, a hospital is considered to be one of our critical infrastructure. And the reason why is that so much of our community relies on what the hospital does. Absolutely. I, I bring, I think you bring up on a very good point where you speak of critical infrastructure, uh, critical facility. Um, having said that, uh, I'm sure there might be some regulations, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, are there any regulations uh, about that, uh, especially critical facilities like uh, hospitals, on what they need to do about business continuity or resiliency in general? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare, what we call CMS, in the United States is a federal regulatory body that oversees all hospital operations in the United States and they have mandatory uh, elements, requirements for planning that are tested. And then we follow a, a standards body called the Joint Commission in the United States that is an interpretation of what the CMS requirements are and then usually that's, uh, they add more to it. It's, it's a starting point, not the goal in terms yeah. of overall emergency planning. And so uh, we are frequently tested against Joint Commission standards to ensure that we're compliant with them. Uh, from an IT security side, our uh, IT department follows something called High Trust, which is a, a standard security model uh, for mm -hmm. testing and evaluation that way as well. And then we'll have uh, other standards such as the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA 1600 and mm -hmm. NFPA 99 that we'll follow in addition to the um, the Joint Commission of CMS requirements. Okay, uh, just on this point that you did mention that uh, there's, uh, you can't close, as a hospital, you can't close your doors to uh, your patients. So we understand that that's the level of criticality that's or the severity that is there in that and uh, you possibly have a very low level of tolerance uh, for sort of outages. Uh, but is there any, uh, I would say, any department or any function within a, a healthcare facility that has slightly more tolerance, but yes, possibly you can be out for an hour or half hour or something like that. Is there any such uh, uh, department or a function within a healthcare facility that has slightly more tolerance compared to the patient facing ones? Sure, absolutely. Uh, a lot of those are in what we would call the environment of care. Um, mm -hmm. And those are based on the recovery time objectives that we establish in the business continuity plans. And the recovery time objectives, each business continuity plan will have a, a number of processes that represent that the core activity for that unit. And each of those processes is then identified to have a designated recovery time objective. And it, it can be a zero tolerance uh, mm -hmm. all the way up to four weeks or more on a depending on the activity it can be tolerated for interruption. Uh, so in some cases we can have, uh, like our emergency departments do have that zero tolerance, they cannot tolerate interruption whatsoever. Um, but other uh, less facing patient care activities uh, or activities that uh, are somewhat deferred in terms of just overall criticality so that they can go a few hours uh, mm -hmm. in the case of our nutritional services, where no, the, the patient's not going to like missing a meal, but they'll be okay. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So we do have some things like that we can tolerate up to several days, uh, depending mm -hmm. on some non-critical patient operations and things of that nature that are just uh, oh, the elective surgeries and things of that it's, nature. Although I will say hospitals are very reluctant to suspend surgeries because that's where a major portion of the revenue stream comes that in. And then there's uh, other things regarding the investment or the, the financial picture of the hospital, depending on what we're talking about, where they can go you know, a month or more uh, in terms of reporting and things like that without having a significant impact. It, it does somewhat vary on um, the hospital's core operations as well. So, for example, a hospital that has a significant amount of surgeries, 
uh, will have a less tolerance to interruption for sterile processing for surgical instrumentation versus mm -hmm. a hospital for whom that's a, you know, less core activity. Uh, but perhaps that same hospital has a higher behavioral health element to it mm -hmm. or something of that nature. So it okay. does, but that is uh, certainly part of our business impact analysis is looking at what those core processes are, determining what the recovery time objective, and that helps to give us a level of criticality and tolerance for interruption. Absolutely. I think that that's a good point to know that there are still some functions which you can uh, do with. Uh, because for us, when we think of hospitals, we are always looking at the front, the patient facing one, so it's, it's, it's always critical. But yes, there are some other back end elements like you're just highlighted, which is, uh, can have some bit of tolerance. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, just moving ahead to my next question. Uh, just wanted to uh, uh, check with you whether there have been any such business continuity incidents that you have been part of. I understand you might have something on the emergency side, so that's maybe from the hospital side. But from a business continuity point of view, any incidents that you have faced, that you have handled, uh, something that you can share with us uh, and all the participants here, without, of course, disclosing any confidential information that you may not want. Sure, of course. Um... We had a situation, this would have been uh, at December of 2021. Uh, we operate primarily in two regions in Washington State. Uh, one, the primary region is the Puget Sound, but we also have uh, a smaller region to our east in Spokane, in Spokane, Washington. Uh, in the Puget Sound region, we had kind of a three-way disaster going on all at the same time. Uh, so uh, in addition to having this cybersecurity issue that and I will point out that this is something that we're becoming increasingly aware of. I mean, we were, it's not that we were never unaware of the uh, potential for uh, vulnerabilities with our key vendors and key suppliers, but it has become more recent where those vulnerabilities have become more uh, visible, perhaps I'll say, uh, due to several incidents. And so in this one case, um, the vendor was Kronos and they had received a worldwide attack uh, on uh, ransomware and they had shut down their operations worldwide and Kronos is a timekeeping and payroll. So we had a going into the Christmas season, which is a, a big holiday here in the United States. Uh, for a moment, there was some um, concern regarding the ability for payroll. Now we did have a payroll processing business continuity plan uh, and the immediate response was just to rerun the last payroll cycle. Uh, which that's fairly standard for business continuity planning and payroll. And that would cover your normal anticipated payroll outage that would last two weeks at most. But this one ended up lasting 12 weeks. <laughs> so we had to uh, go way beyond what the initial scope and prediction for a payroll outage was. So that's one issue going on. Uh, the second was we had a COVID spike. So we had an increase in uh, patient load coming into the hospitals uh, in excess of about 140% of hospital capacity. Uh, and then of course it always has a corresponding decrease in available personnel because a, a portion of our employees are also experiencing COVID uh, mm -hmm. or their family members. And so now you have an increase in employee absenteeism. And then we had a regional winter storm going on. So we had a, a significant, for our region, uh, winter ice and snow event uh, mm -hmm. that was not just affecting our hospitals, but also affecting key suppliers and vendors. Some of our local key suppliers and vendors were unable to deliver uh, in the case of like bottled oxygen, things of that nature. So we had a, a three-way disaster going on <laughs> that way. Um, it was very interesting and it came back to, again, managing those available resources that supported those critical operations that we were trying to sustain that way. Uh, I am pleased to say that, you know, today everything's back to normal, but for about 10 days, um, those three-way disasters all at the same time were very challenging to be able to manage. And there were moments when we had emergency departments running out of oxygen. There were moments when, uh, we opted to pay, uh, just rerun that last pay cycle. So we then had to spend a lot of time trying to do validation of data uh, mm -hmm. against the payroll and do what they call true up, meaning that you're trying to validate the, the payroll versus the information. So in some cases, we overpaid uh, mm -hmm. our employees. In some cases, employees who had left the company, but that had not yet been reflected in the payroll record were being paid. In other cases, employees had been underpaid, and so we had to correct that as well. Mm -hmm. 
So I think, yeah, that's pretty much, uh, uh, as they say, Murphy's Law, all that can go wrong, went wrong at the same time. Precisely. And, uh, possibly you had to do a prioritization among those three as well as to which to deal with first. <laughs> And yes. I believe, uh, oxygen uh, patient facing one possibly came out on top. Correct. So, yeah. Right. Thanks. Uh, so from uh, thanks for mentioning that, and uh, if I may ask you, how uh, did you factor those, uh, or what were the lessons that you learned, and how did you factor those back into your plans? So uh, in some cases during the event, we have to quickly uh, adapt to current situation. So with regards to oxygen, we began uh, sharing the available inventory between the different hospitals. So that those hospitals were less affected, perhaps they had received a shipment or they had more on hand inventory. We were sharing in, uh, the hospital, uh, excuse me, the oxygen supply with other hospitals who were suffering for that. So we uh, very quickly basically um, accelerate our internal inventory management principles that way and, and we're able to ship around the region. Um, the other issue we had to do was um, to make sure that we had reassured our employees. Uh, you can imagine there's a high level of anxiety going on, uh, wondering whether or not they're going to be able to, you know, pay their bills and things like that. So there was a lot of internal communication reassurance that way. Uh, and then in some cases having to go uh, to uh, alternate secondary and tertiary vendors, uh, the primary vendor for whatever reason just isn't able to meet our requirements. So then we went and and found a second or a third vendor who was able to meet that. And this is, uh, has become an ongoing theme for 2022, and that is vendor validation, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that the vendors that we are critically relying upon, and healthcare organizations have hundreds, if not thousands, that they rely on, mm -hmm. is to make sure that the vendors themselves are also pursuing best practices and business continuity, and that they are also being well prepared so that they don't affect our operations if they're having an issue. Absolutely. In fact, uh, I just had uh, a, a question which I haven't really asked. I was looking at from the point of view of suppliers. That both uh, our earlier speakers mentioned about uh, supplies as well as one of the critical elements. And the oxygen, I think, masks and those sort of things we, we understand as a layman. But uh, from an insider point of view, uh, how would you or uh, what would you rate as uh, the most important element of supplies for a healthcare facility? <clears throat> Probably the number one critical supply for a healthcare facility would be municipal water supplies. Uh, a healthcare organization often can endure a power outage better than can endure a disruption for uh, potable water that mm -hmm. way. Uh, if we're talking about supplies in terms of non-utilities, probably our critical pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a significant concern we have right now in the United States regarding the key pharmaceutical ingredients, what they call KPIs, mm -hmm. that are manufactured outside the United States, uh, in, certainly in some areas of China, that have been affected by uh, both COVID outbreaks and other geopolitical events as to whether or not those key pharmaceutical ingredients will be available for manufacture. Mm -hmm. We can't tolerate an interruption of some types of medications. And so in some cases, our pharmaceutical supply chain has go, had to go to a, a fifth level of backup. So, uh, you know, our, our primary, secondary, tertiary, quandary, and now we're into the fifth level of backup mm -hmm. for some of these supplies because of the global supply chain interruptions that we've seen. Thanks for that. I think that has been an important point uh, in many industries and I'm sure in healthcare as well. We have seen that uh, firsthand experience that as well in some cases, personally experienced that in my case as well, where uh, there have been shortages of supplies and how that has impacted uh, obviously not only the patients, but also the hospitals as well. So uh, that's something definitely. And uh, from your response about how you have gone to the fifth level of uh, redundancy, you know, I think that's really uh, talking a lot about supplies and the importance of supplies. Uh, moving quickly differently now onto uh, a personalized uh, uh, domain, if I may ask you. Um, you are in this business conduct profession. You have been uh, part of the emergency management team as well. So what is it that drives you and keeps you happy about doing this, uh, performing this role? I have a passion for mitigation and uh, the emergency management, the way we de define our emergency management versus business continuity activities for our, you know, our executives and our internal employees is business continuity is focused inwards, you know, and towards the ability of the organization to be able to perform its critical tasks. Uh, 
the emergency management portion is focused towards the community and our ability to assist the community no matter what's going on. The mitigation element comes in on both sides, and that is, can we mitigate the impacts on the community by making sure that we have good correlation with uh, our other healthcare providers in the region, our health departments or governmental uh, interfaces with the community at the local and state level uh, and federal level, and then making sure that we are continually uh, well prepared so that no matter what's coming into the hospitals, that we're able to manage that. And so I do have a passion for both sides, the ability to be able to support the community no matter what's going on, but also ensuring that the organization has done its proper planning and, and efforts to ensure that it's in a position to be able to help the community. If we don't have business continuity, then we won't be in a position to be able to assist the community. If we don't have an emergency management, then we won't have any systems in place to be able to assist the community either. That way, so I do find a passion in both. Thanks. I think that's quite uh, insightful, uh, especially on the difference between the two. Quite a few uh, people here may have had that uh, thought of what is the difference between emergency and business continuity. I think that uh, has also been clarified. Uh, possibly the final question from my side is, uh, uh, and this is coming to you uh, since you're also an adjunct professor. So if somebody wants to take up a career in business community, not necessarily in the healthcare industry, but in any industry, or maybe even in the healthcare industry. So what are the top three things that they need to, uh, need to really uh, look at and uh, how, how would they be able to do a good job about it? Uh, the first would be to be aware of the standards. There's quite a bit of uh, work out there regarding uh, bodies of standard that we can look at so they can begin to orient themselves to what represents good business continuity practices. So, you know, there's, uh, and I follow the DRII methods, the Disaster Recovery Institute International, that's where my certification comes through. But there's also the Business Continuity, uh, BCI, Business Continuity International. Um, looking at standards like NFPA 1600 or ISO 22301 and becoming aware of those. That would be my first recommendation for that. Uh, the second would be to uh, try to identify what industry they're interested in because in addition to the generalized standards for business continuity, there are gonna be industry specific standards like in my case, CMS and the Joint Commission uh, that would affect your your nation or your region or your industry that you're looking at. And then the third one, and this is where LinkedIn can be very useful, start doing informational interviews. Find someone who does business continuity or emergency management in an industry that you're interested in or a region that you're interested in and reach out to them and see if they're willing to have a conversation with you so that you can then learn more about nuances uh, regarding that particular industry or that particular region uh, about that. When I first did my own uh, per, uh, informational interviews and professional networking like this, uh, I was told that I would never be able to combine a career in emergency management and business continuity, oh. that I had to pick one or the <laughs> other. Uh, I politely ignored them and went on and found uh, some examples of some colleagues, uh, Valerie Lucas, who used to be at, at uh, uh, University of California, and I forget which the subcampus of that system was, but she was with UCLA possibly, and uh, looked at her and found and found some articles that she had been quoted in that, yes, in fact, you could combine business continuity with emergency management, and here's how. Um, I pursued both certifications and had received both certifications in 2008, and that's been my career ever since, uh, first in higher education and, of course, later in healthcare, uh, combining those two, and, and that's exactly why I was hired for the uh, academic work that I do as well. Uh, and teaching uh, business continuity, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels, uh, and talking about how business continuity is interfacing with other you know, risk management and emergency management activities that way too. So that, those would be my three recommendations. Is one, become aware of standards and bodies of standards as best practices. Uh, two, become aware of nuances for uh, what uh, region or nation that you plan to operate in alongside which industry. And then three, identify someone who operates in those industries and reach out to them and have a conversation with them. In my experience, most professionals are happy to talk about what they do. At the end of the session, again, a big thank you to Scott. Thanks for your time in speaking with us, in sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, your experience. Take care. You have a good day. Bye-bye.